Healthcare is changing, and Dr. Nancy RN is here for you. The topics are many, but each program stands on its own with three key action points for you to learn. Your guide to a healthier you in a changing world. Dr. Nancy RN. Welcome to Dr. Nancy RN. Healthy you, healthy nation, healthy world. I'm Nancy Valentine, PhD and registered nurse. And this show is dedicated to you, the healthcare consumer. We hope that you will gain some information and knowledge that you can use to improve your health and wellness. And to that end, we have a wonderful guest here today, my friend and colleague, Denise Murphy. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Denise and her background, and then she's going to give you some really important information on how you can be safe when you go to the hospital. So let me tell you about Denise. Denise is born and bred in Philadelphia, and she attended St. Joseph's Hospital School of St. Christopher's. St. Joseph's Hospital School of Nursing. Sorry, Saint, that's okay. And, and it was. And then worked later. And at worked later at St. Christopher's. Thank you. And went to LaSalle. Then she journeyed north to Portland, Maine, and she got her baccalaureate degree there. And then eventually was out in St. Louis, where she became an epidemiologist and got a degree through the School of Public Health. Now, Denise's uh, presentation today is really going to focus on three key areas and something that you may not have really thought about. And that is, we have a wonderful healthcare system, but many times when you enter into that healthcare system, it can be somewhat scary territory because we have to work hard as healthcare providers to be sure that it's safe and that the quality care that you're giving getting is the tops and that's really Denise's role because currently she's vice president of quality and patient safety at Mainline Health, five hospital system here in the main line. And she and I worked together and through that partnership we did a lot of work in this quality and patient safety. So I know firsthand about how incredible Denise is and how passionate she is about her role. So the three key points that we're going to talk about is how the, the system really works. She's going to tell you about her day and what she really looks at. The second is human error. There are a lot of moving parts inside of a healthcare system. A lot of people touching other people, doing things to people, all of which is an opportunity for human error. And our jobs together, doctors, nurses, and everyone that is really in that environment, including you, have to really be knowledgeable about how to decrease the human error. So she's going to talk to you about what you might see, the kind of activities that you will see. And you can then really connect the dots and see that this is really related to trying to protect you while you or your family member is in the hospital. And then the third set of variables that she's going to talk about is what can you do directly? How can you really prevent any error and how can you add to the best patient experience that you or your family or friends are going to have. So again, welcome Denise, thank you for being our guest. We're really blessed to have you here. Thank you, Nancy, I certainly appreciate it. And for those of you who are wondering why we have flowers on, it's National Patient Safety Awareness Week. So let me digress a little bit and, and get to the big picture before I talk about what my day is like every day at Mainline Health and speak to how this patient safety movement started in the country. In 1999, there was a, a landmark report um, called To Err as Human. The Institute of Medicine conducted the report, the government funded it, and looked at over 36,000 hospital discharges. So patients that were in hospitals for various reasons, but what did they experience that was unexpected? Now let me just tell you uh, a little bit about the Institute of Medicine because many of you may not be aware that the Institute of Medicine is an arm of the National Science Foundation. It's in Washington, D.C. And what this group does is it brings in national experts and sometimes even international experts to study a particular problem. And then they write a very factual report and they give a lot of high level recommendations. And therefore it gives guidance and sort of a direction to the healthcare world about how to study any particular problem. So this particular problem that uh, they were studying as Denise has been describing to you was really what are the errors? What are sort of the safety issues that we have to really inside of our <coughs> excuse me industry of healthcare really have to address Correct, and that was followed in the year 2001 by a second report called Crossing the Quality Chasm. And so that looked at what is what does the quality of our health care in the United States look like. So quality and patient safety only differ in the way that quality is defined as um, doing all of the evidence-based measures, so all of the things that science has proven to 
um, result in the desired outcome for a patient and their family and to make sure that that's delivered routinely every time to every mm -hmm. patient where those patients are, you know, warrant that type of care. So quality is ensuring that you go into a hospital and you have the desired outcome. Patient mm -hmm. safety is about delivering health care without harm, healing without mm -hmm. harm. So that's what that's about and that's why they go hand in hand. But it's an important differentiation because there are different activities that go Correct, there are different this. activities. So for example in quality, it, one of the things that we do is y you can't deliver quality without measuring to understand mm -hmm. are we doing what we say uh, that we're doing and are we are we meeting the um, the standards of care that are out there. So for example if you come into the hospital with chest pain and you're your EKG shows that you are probably in the throes of an active heart attack. So we call that ac acute myocardial infarction. It's a heart attack. So there are there is a bundle of approximately five or six things that have to happen in a short period of time. So one of them is you know getting the EKG, getting the certain blood tests done, giving aspirin within mm -hmm. a certain period of time, understanding if a patient needs to have uh, a procedure to open up a vessel. Mm -hmm. So all of that stuff, ha if we say we're going to do it, we have to measure to see if we're doing it well. So a lot of quality is really about measure measurement. Patient safety, on the other hand, is the, the study and the measurement of the types of errors, the types of unexpected events that occur in hospitals. Let me run you through the most common ones. And Nancy, you're very familiar with all of these. So these are ho um, ho hospital acquired infections, they're medication errors, they're falls, falls with harm. Which imagine how hard that is because people fall everywhere. They fall at the supermarket, they fall at the mall. But when they're in the hospital, they're often confused, especially if they're elderly. They can be young and confused because mm -hmm. they're receiving pain medications. Right. They can be so sick that just getting up, the weakness that they experience, getting up and getting to the bathroom, and one of the things we wish people would do, so I know I'm jumping into the what you can do, but one of the causes of errors is that people do not want to interrupt or bother their health care provider by hitting that call button to say, I need some assistance going to the bathroom. I feel weak. I feel a little bit dizzy. So they get up and they try to venture to the bathroom themselves and down they go. So that's one of the biggest reasons why falls occur in the hospital is that people are confused or they're medicated. Uh, or they're weak and they do not want to ask for help. So the second, or they thing, hit that call button and they don't get the response. And they don't get for. the response that they're looking for. So someone may be in the room with a patient that's experiencing chest pain. So that's life threatening. The nurse sees another call bell going off, knows I have to get to that. But if it's someone that needs assistance with toileting versus someone who might be vomiting or might, you right. know, be experiencing something as frightening as chest pain. So there's lots of reasons why you might not get an immediate response. But the frightening thing is that you're at risk for falling right. for all the reasons that we outlined. And that's a very uh, large volume of the errors or the the. Um, adverse events that we see. The second one is infections, and there are different types of infections. There are device-related infections. What does that mean? You come into the hospital, there are certain things in your blood that need to be monitored, so we have to do blood work frequently, and, and there's a lot of medications that have to be delivered, so we put in vascular lines. So you may have experienced, if you've ever been in a hospital or if your loved one has, you may have experienced an IV or a much more complex central line. We call them central lines because they are threaded into the heart so they are doing central monitoring of all of our systems so they're life-saving we need them they can be life-threatening because the longer these devices remain in the more they become uh, a port for infection for bacteria that lives on the skin, lives in the hospital room, our visitors that are coming in with a runny nose or you know blowing into tissues and not washing hands. So it really becomes mm -hmm. an issue of protecting the patient with the device, caring for the device using what we call a nursing aseptic technique and sterile technique or clean technique is sometimes used. And then the other thing is getting those devices out as soon as we can possibly care for the patient safely without them. And then the second big category of infections occur after procedures, largely often after surgery. Surgical site infections, mm -hmm. for example. So they're, they're very frightening. A third type of event is the breakdown of skin. So we call them pressure ulcers. And pressure ulcers occur because people often 
the elderly are undernourished, they might be suffering from malnutrition, they also may be too sick to be able to easily move them. If they're in pain, they won't want to move themselves. And, and it's amazing how little pressure it really takes to cause skin breakdown. So I won't get into right, much more about right. that, but it's another common thing that we see in hospitals. And you may know that better by the term bed sores. Bed know. sores. And people Thank can get you. those at home as well That's as in correct. the hospital. So some of the, the things that we do in hospitals really transfer if you're caring for someone at home. They have to be turned frequently, toileted frequently, they have to be kept dry, et cetera, all those, those key points. Correct. And medication errors is another area that is rather frightening. Luckily, there's been technology that helps reduce the incidence of a medication error because we have patients with bracelets, we have barcodes on medications or labels that include a barcode. So if you see your nurse scanning the medication and then scanning your bracelet, checking your identification is so important. We ask patients for their name and date of birth so often that sometimes they get frustrated. Right. We have to remind them this is one of our patient safety measures measures to make sure, of course I know who you are, but I've just delivered medication to seven other patients. I'm absolutely going to be certain that I'm delivering the right medication. When you hear me say, you know, what you're receiving and your name and date of birth, if there was any kind of mix up, maybe they put somebody in the wrong bed after transportation right, right. to a laboratory or, or for an x-ray. So all of these things uh, come into play, but medication errors have also gone down greatly in our country because of the support of, of very good technologies. And then a final thing, not the only thing, but a final thing that I'll talk about because I know our time is limited, is transitions in care. Hospital staff will tell us that the riskiest time for an error to occur is the handoff of a patient from one level of care to another, the handoff to do a diagnostic study in another department of the hospital, or when they're transferring a patient out of the hospital to either their home, to a long-term care facility or a skilled nursing facility. And so these are times when it's so risky. We're handing off a human being with a lot of complexities right. and we're handing off information. So the handoff of information and getting it right every time is so important. So there's a lot of focus on transitions in care because we find that readmissions in this country, a patient that would be discharged and within a 30-day period is right back in the hospital, is something that our government is trying to help us work on because there's an incredible cost. The first cost is to the patient and their family always, but the second cost is in healthcare dollars. So how can we do a better job at preparing a patient to go home or to go for a short visit to a uh, skilled nursing facility or even to a longer term visit, what do we do with them, with their family, and with other community providers, including, so importantly, their primary care physician or their, their family right. doctor right. as we know right. them, so that we don't drop information. We don't you know, they don't fall between the cracks. We give them an appointment to come for blood tests and often we don't stop to ask the questions, do you have family support? Do you have transportation? Right. Can you right. get to your next appointment with your physician after we allow you to leave the hospital? Right. So patients come back to the hospital through emergency departments because they don't really know how to handle their care at home. Let me give Those you are a, the biggest areas. Let me I give think. you an example of that, a personal example. First of all, the, the example that Denise just mentioned, I'm thinking to myself as she's saying, you know, if you need to come back for a blood test, you know, can you actually get there? I'm thinking if you make a hairdressing appointment, they call you the day before to be sure you're going to show <laughs> that's up. Right. I mean, here's right. something that's even more important, obviously, and uh, it's like sort of up to you if you get back there. But my father was um, uh, very seriously ill and had major cardiac surgery on an emergency basis. He was very fortunate to be in a facility here in Philadelphia, Jefferson University, that literally saved his life. Um, he did very well through the uh, post-op course, but only retrospectively did we find out later when he was discharged to home that he had told the nurse right before he left that he had some pain in his affected leg where in those days they were stripping out the vein to then use it in the, um, the heart. Um, and that has to heal, the, the leg has to heal independent of what, what the healing process is with your heart. And that can get infected. And one of the first 
signs of infection is you know either swelling or it's warm to the touch mm -hmm. or the patient experiences pain so he had said to the nurse right before he was leaving within the hour of leaving he said you know I really have some pain in my leg and she said I will tell the doctor now we'll never know how that fell through the cracks but whoever told who or didn't tell who or no one really reacted he went home and three days later had a massive infection my mother had to drive him to the hospital. She thought he was going to die en route. And he was in the hospital for weeks after that. In fact, they had to actually strip down his leg again, open it up like they do in the military, mm -hmm. and let it open to the air to down to the bone. Yeah. And I was calling it filet of leg. Mm -hmm. You know, that he, you, he just had to have that much intervention for it to stabilize before they could then, you know, suture it up again. So it was a real great example, not that it was very great, but it was right. as an, a startling example of right. the kinds of things that happen every day if people every do day. not communicate these things accurately. Exactly, and Nancy, you also point out the important role of the partnership of the patient and their family. Right. We always ask patients and families to speak up, and sometimes they're very intimidated to speak up to a clinician, a physician, a nurse, who they feel have a little bit more authority in the healthcare arena. But patients are so uh, such important partners, and I'll get to that in just one minute, but I want to mention mm -hmm. an important part of quality is the measurement, and understanding the measures that are available Available to the public because there's a lot of transparency now in healthcare that didn't exist 10 years ago. The state of Pennsylvania was the first state in the United States to make very transparent some of the outcomes of care. I'll use infections, Nancy, because of your father's story. So in the state of Pennsylvania, PHC4, the Pennsylvania Healthcare Cost Containment Council, first challenge hospitals to start to publicly report infections in the state of Pennsylvania. I was in Missouri then and quite frightened that this would become a, a national trend, which it has. Why was it frightening to me? So as a patient, as a daughter of a mother who had an infection as well, um, it was the right thing to do. I wanted it to happen. As a professional who deals with quality measurement, I was so afraid that we wouldn't be able to explain mm -hmm. what a lot of these metrics meant. Yeah. All things, all bad things that happen in healthcare are not preventable. Many of them are. That's why people like me and the teams of doctors and nurses and therapists and technologists that work with me are dedicated to patient safety. But one of the things to be that I stress is that all bad outcomes, um, infections or falls or bed sores, pressure ulcers, are not preventable, but the majority of them we're starting to believe are. So if you go to hospitalcompare.gov um, online, you can find your hospital, whether it's Bryn Mawr, whether it's Doylestown, Chester County. You can put in your zip code and you can find your hospitals. One word of caution about that is that the data that you're looking at is old. It's well explained and it's very real. What do you mean by old data? It might be a year old, Nancy. They oh, okay. may say that the, you know these data are for the time period of you know the calendar year of 2011. So one of the things that I do every day is lead performance improvement teams that really work on taking Taking these data, the information that we're publicly reporting and saying, we must do better. We've got to strive for zero infections, mm -hmm. for zero falls with harm, for zero medication errors. And how can we do that? So teams of doctors and nurses, and as you well know, engineers, we have industrial engineers, we have mechanical engineers mm -hmm. that belong to the patient safety and quality teams that are helping us study why these events that we don't want to happen still do, including the human factors aspects of, of changing practice, but they also help us to re redesign patient care. So that's the kind of thing that I do every day. But what should you be thinking about every day as a patient? And Nancy sharing her story uh, reminded me of the third very important point that she made and that is you're a critical partner in your care. The Absolutely. first thing is to be knowledgeable that bad things do happen because healthcare is a complex system of human beings caring for very sick human beings. And so we, all humans, the best and brightest, will make mistakes. So what do we do to try to um, prevent those mistakes is what I do every day. But what can you do, for example, to prevent an infection? If you're going into a hospital and you're going to have major surgery, an important thing to know is that big risk factors for post-operative mm -hmm. after the procedure infections are obesity, smoking, 
and diabetes that is either undiagnosed or blood sugars of diabetics that are out of control. So if your blood sugar is really high and you're not managing that well with your family doctor or your nurse practitioner that you see, you could develop an infection because high blood sugar is a barrier to good wound healing. Smoking is a barrier to good perfusion of your lungs. After a surgery, say if you have a big uh, incision in your belly or in your chest, just taking a deep breath really hurts. If you're a smoker and you have to go under anesthesia and we want you to really breathe deeply afterwards, you're at risk for developing a pneumonia if you are a smoker. So it's why we try very hard in our prevention programs, especially if you have heart or lung disease or diabetes to try to get you to stop smoking. Obesity is another, uh, we talk about all the time in public health, the obesity, the epidemic of obesity in the United States, starting with our very young people. What's important for you to know about that in healthcare is that the more weight you carry, the harder it is for wounds to heal because you have more tissue that's been cut through, more layers of skin and tissue that have been cut through. But even more importantly, it doesn't allow you to breathe deeply mm -hmm. and as easily after a procedure if you are obese. So, and if you have a knee replacement or a hip replacement, which is very common, the longer we live, the more likely arthritis right, right. will result in the need for one of those infections. So understanding your risk factors for infection and working with your physician or your nurse practitioner to know the importance of weight loss. And these things are very hard, smoking, weight loss, and diet are the three hardest yeah. things that we deal with as a society. Right, and here's another takeaway. This is like the show of, uh, you know, disclosure of family events, but I had a cousin who died very recently. And here is really, again, a connect the dots opportunity. He had diabetes, uh, he was uh, aware of it, but he was really not following his diet. Um, he was really not compliant, so to speak. And then he had an accident and he had to have major belly surgery. And one of the reasons that his healing was uh, interrupted and he, he was critically ill is that his diabetes really prevented that wound healing and that became an issue. And he was in the hospital for many months before he actually died. Correct. But uh, it wasn't the only thing, but it was definitely a huge contributing factor. A contributing factor. And he, and he didn't understand, you know, when he's right. in bed and wondering why his uh, wound isn't healing, that all that behavior of, not, of eating cookies and right. chocolates and, and not paying attention to his diet, now he was paying the price for it. Correct. The point that you just made, now he was paying the price. So we don't know. So today when I leave the studio, I could walk in front of a car. So you can't always plan the health care right. that you're going right. to need. Some of it is scheduled and some of it is very accidental and, and very unexpected. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you should always carry with you your list of medications. That's so important. That's so we point. do something in the hospital. Your nurses and the pharmacists that work with us in healthcare will do what's called medication reconciliation with you and your physician. So one of the most important aspects of medication reconciliation is step one. That's under Understanding when a patient hits our doors via through the emergency department or a scheduled appointment or being transferred from your doctor's office or brought in by an ambulance. We need you to have the right medications with you and we need to understand what is this patient taking because if we don't know that we may order a medication for you that interacts with something that you're on. You may not be a good verbal reporter right. when you're sick or you're hurt or, or you're in pain. Or you may not have the opportunity. You may be unconscious. You might be unconscious. Your family members may not even know. And even if you know the medications you're on, you may not know the dosage. So in order to prevent medication errors or adverse medication events, we want to make sure that people are very aware and can explain the medications they're on, the dosages they take, and the best thing is to have a little card and write that down. Right. My final message is speak up for safety. Speak up for your own safety. If something doesn't look or feel right to you, bring it up. You are our most important partner in your care. Don't be afraid of a punitive reaction from doctors or nurses. They may be stressed, they may look angry, but really this is about you speaking up for your safety. If you're a family member, speak up for your loved one who may not be able to speak up for themselves as your mother did so well with your father.
Right. Well, I, I want to go back to the little card that Denise was giving you the prompt to really have all of your medications. That should also include your vitamins and any herbal remedies that you're taking because some of these things have uh, synergistic, so to speak, uh, reactions with other medications. So if you were in an emergency situation, for instance, it would be very helpful for that team to know what you're taking, not just the prescribed medications, but things that you are taking as well. So, you know, be sure to add that to your list and put that card in your wallet. I think the other is um, some of the things that you could do that would also enhance some of the, the tips that uh, Denise has already shared is like when you have communication in a hospital, like using my father's example, for instance, again, you know, hindsight's 50-50, but if, my, if he had said that to my mother, you know, I really have pain in my leg, it's very good to repeat things. So a family member could have said, gee, my husband said that he had pain in his leg. Can I, you know, talk to the doctor before we leave? I'd like to have someone see him. Don't expect that in the busy world of a hospital that, you know, I give credit to the nurse. She could have very much given that message to the doctor on the phone. Uh, maybe the doctor, you know, is busy, forgot. Mm -hmm. Maybe she never gave the message. Who knows? But, you know, the communication get, can get so lost in the shuffle. So you repeating and making sure that you see someone visually before you leave so that you have that conversation, that is your empowerment. That is what we're trying to get across to you, that you have every right to have those conversations. That is what you're paying for. That is what you need to do to prevent any further complications. So I hope that what we've done today is give you some really hardcore facts and also some tips on how you can take care of yourself more effectively while we're doing our best to take care of you. Thank you so much for being with us and we will follow up with some of these topics in subsequent shows in more detail. Thank you again. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today and that the information will help you in meeting your health goals. Catch this program and other conversations on the website, drnancyrn.com. Or you can write to me as well. I welcome your comments and feedback. Thank you for listening and join us again. And remember, with health, all things are possible.